Welcome to A History of Health in Hull, a series of webinars starting with prehistory before events were recorded down to now. This is the second webinar, Health and Hull in the Medieval Age, 1299 to 1485. My name's Rob Bell, the writer and voice for the series. Let's get started. Here we are in the series. Let's start with section one, a birth certificate. The settlement of Wyke had been founded on land owned by Muse Abbey near Beverley. By the 1280s, plots had been laid out and settled alongside the River Hull in the area of High Street, Lowgate and Market Gate. All of these exist today. In 1293, this growing port was acquired from Muse by Edward I and renamed Kingston upon Hull, after which an additional larger grid of streets was laid out. This medieval street pattern is still in existence today. And then, in 1299, the charter that formalised Kingston upon Hull. Flood risk has been a constant threat to Hull. Let's go back to 1314 to 1316, when it rained almost constantly throughout the summer and autumn of each year. Crops rotted in the ground, harvests failed and livestock drowned or starved, food stocks depleted and the price of food soared. The result was the Great Famine, which over the next few years is thought to have claimed over 5 to 10% of the British population, and this was worse across the Humber. This is an early illustration of climate change. The shortage of crops pushed up prices of everyday necessities such as vegetables, wheat, barley and oats. Bread was therefore expensive and because the grain had to be dried before it could be used, it was of very poor quality. Salt, the only way at that time to cure and preserve meat, was difficult to obtain because it was much harder to extract through evaporation in wet weather and its price rose dramatically. As we've seen, topography has been key to Hull's development. In fact, so marshy was the surrounding terrain that the city relied more on the river system you can see here than roads for centuries. In practice, this map is more like the London Underground, connecting markets than a map of rivers alone. It's worth highlighting that until the Black Death, there were many landing stages on the rivers you can see here. This meant that the reach of the raw materials and produce highlighted across Europe to the right had better market access than any road system could have offered. The Baltic trade was growing around iron and timber from Scandinavia, masts from Poland, flax and hemp from across Poland and into Russia. In the later Middle Ages, as in the 13th century, many of the inhabitants of the town were incomers, attracted most strongly perhaps during Hull's high prosperity in the late 14th and early 15th centuries. Many were from Holderness close by and others from the Wolds. Then a number from the West Riding, including a group naturally drawn down the Humber from the villages lining its banks. A sprinkling was contributed by the rest of the country, and a few were from overseas, from ports such as Dordrecht and La Rochelle. The Great Famine of 1315-17 to was the first of a series of large-scale crises that struck Europe in the 14th century. Cattle disease caused sheep and cattle numbers across Europe to fall by as much as 80%, not good for protein, and a knock-on effect for leather goods, which had long been strong in Hull. Then, a decline in foreign trade in the 15th and 16th centuries made for a fall in revenues, and this triggered a deterioration in many health conditions. This is the impact of the Black Death, which we'll see wipes out 60% of the population of Europe. This is how Wyke became Kingston upon Hull from 1260 through to the time of the Black Death. To the east, the River Hull. South and the River Humber. The High Street, which is still there, was where loading and unloading of cargoes took place. A grid of streets builds to the west. A marketplace emerges, not in the form of a square, but where the King Billy statue and Hull Minster are located today. 
Then the city walls. You can see this by 1347. This old town footprint remains, though the bricks from the walls were used to build the docks that emerge, as we'll see in the next webinar, along the line of the walls. Later, Daniel Defoe would highlight the crowded nature of the city within the walls, and Dr. Wright, Hull's medical officer for health from 1881 to 1925, was to remark, Can it be wondered at, under such circumstances, that the town became liable to periodical visitations of plague, the sweating sickness, and other frightful diseases, hurrying young men and women to their graves by the score? The link between the built environment... Let's look more closely at the grid. This is Kingston-upon-Hull in the 14th and 15th centuries. After 1299, the physical improvements and the constant acquisition and exchange of properties amongst the wealthier inhabitants demonstrates growth. By 1300, Hull had 15 streets and even a royal mint. We have High Street and we have Lowgate appearing. The town walls are built in 1322. They're crenellated in 1327. More houses being squeezed into old plots as reflected in rental maps of 1320 and 1347. Beyond the walls, Hull Fair starts up in 1279, Charterhouse in 1377. Within the walls, sanitary conditions deteriorate. Dung was dumped at the sides of the open sewers in the haven. Gutters were obstructed, latrines made in the town ditch, pigsties were kept in the houses, sheepskins were thrown down in the shambles, and the cleaning of streets and marketplace was neglected. The supply of fresh water presented perhaps an even greater problem than sewerage. In the absence of fresh water beneath the town, the wells and ponds were of little use and water had to be brought three miles in an open dike from Anlaby. For 12 years in the mid-15th century, the water was conveyed in an underground lead pipe and pipes were even laid into the town itself. Maybe this system worked, maybe not. In any case, the lead was taken up to pay for debts from the Wars of the Roses. So much for clean water. I'm using this map from a later era, 1850, to highlight one of the major contributions of Edward I to the growth of Hull. From 1301, he sanctioned the construction of roads through the floodplain to Hessel and Holderness and the Beverly High Road to York, raising the thoroughfare above the water table. Here's why. The town was set within the low-lying wetlands of the Lower Hull Valley, and as the nearest higher ground lay some five kilometres to the north and west, there were no other natural defences which could be utilised, other than the character of the immediately surrounding boggy ground, which, as late as 1677, was described as a forsaken country. The low-lying and badly drained nature of the wetland on which the town was to develop meant that it would always be prone to flooding. This was to prove a major strength in planning its defence against attack from the landward sides, and it was to prove a decisive factor in the town being able to withstand two major sieges during the English Civil War. Most of the roads through this badly drained landscape were prone to flooding for several months of the year, and in bad weather could be washed away entirely. Beyond the city walls, plots owned by the council were let at no rent save the obligation to maintain flood defence, hence a number of windmills. Draining the land was a priority during the 12th and 13th centuries. Dykes crisscrossing Holderness were a feature of the low-lying landscape. Flatlands, slow rivers and grain-rich farming were ideal for the harvests. Windmills, these were post mills, little gabled cabins pivoted to rotate atop a strong upright post, were a feature of the landscape. Harvesting the wind for milling power was useful. 
William de Force, Count of Aumal, 1190-1195, granted a postmill to Meuse Abbey just before he left for the Crusades. Just before the Black Death hits England in 1348, Hull's population had reached 8,000. What were they like? Ian Mortimer's Guide to Medieval England gives visitors to the 14th century useful insights into the sights, smells and tastes of 14th century England. The Oxford Book of Medieval England spans several centuries in over a hundred documents that present social and political history as well as the lived experience of a range of historical actors. And then the Victoria History of the East Riding helps us focus local specifics. So too, the work of Professor Barbara English, the Lords of Holderness, 1086 to 1260, is superb. Focusing on Hull, the distribution of wealth among the townsmen suggests that there was a marked preponderance of poor families and that at least in the 14th century, even the merchant class enjoyed only modest resources. When the tax of 1332 was assessed, perhaps half of the householders were too poor to be taxed at all. The poorest inhabitants of the town have left little to reveal their circumstances, but for the small craftsmen and tradesmen there are wills with typically humble belongings and modest bequests. One man, desiring to be buried next to his former master, bequeathed no money, only small amounts of honey, iron and lead. In terms of gentry, William de la Pole was a significant figure, remembered subsequently by a chronicler as second to no other English merchant. This pattern of wealth was very similar to that in York at about the same time. The Delapoles are important and worth an aside. Sir William Delapole was born between 1290 and 1295, in or near Hull. Some say that he came from Ravensar Odd, anticipating its demise. He died in 1366. Using Hull as his base, he had become an influential and wealthy merchant by importing wine and exporting wool and corn. By 1325, he started to loan money to the king, and this was tracked at about £13,000. Edward was using Hull as a base camp for the Scottish Wars, and the loans were used to fund these wars and those in Gascony in France. In 1331, he was made mayor of Hull, and then, as he becomes a national figure, he becomes Baron of the Exchequer. Now, things get sticky. In 1354, he was charged with treason for corruption. Then a pardon. The king cancels all the loans. From then, William tended to stay back in Hull until his death in 1366. Thereafter, family fortunes could be described as up and down. And we'll cover this in the next webinar. Before we focus the Black Death, we need to add a wider perspective. In many standard histories of the early medieval period, bubonic plague is the only medical condition mentioned. People lived a tough life and injury at work must have been commonplace. What about broken bones? An excavation by Cambridge University archaeologists in an Augustan friary in Cambridge in 2021 offers a useful insight. Using X-ray analysis, the team found nearly half, that's 44% of people on the lowest rung of the social ladder from the 10th to the 14th centuries, suffered some form of broken bone by the time they died. The team also uncovered noteworthy cases such as a friar who resembles a modern hit-and-run victim and bones that hint at lives blighted by violence. These types of injury are borne out in Hull with the excavation at the Augustine Friary in 1994. One of the huge assets to any review of health in Hull comes from the dig over at the Augustan Friary in 1994. You can see this on the map. Bone fragments indicate that the friar's diet was mainly cattle, sheep, pig, chicken, goose and duck. The pigs may have been slaughtered on site. There were 11 species of fish eaten, of which nine were salt water varieties. The latter may have been purchased as dried, salted fish from hull fishermen who worked the oceans as far away as Iceland. As an archaeological site, this Friars' area was greatly blessed by the high degree of preservation 
from the waterlogged soil. In addition to numerous complete items of clothing, evidence was also found of exquisite medieval carpentry in the surviving coffins. Moreover, the human remains unearthed represent one of the most informative samples of England's medieval population found anywhere in the country. As with almost any medieval population, there were several examples of fractures and infections of the long bones and tooth cavities, a little bit like in Cambridge. Almost a third of the adult burials within the church had suffered from degenerative joint diseases. Some of the Augustinians appear to have verged towards the sin of gluttony, and a fair number of adult skeletons demonstrated marked signs of a bone disorder called dish diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. This is associated with a limited diet high in cholesterol, coupled with a lifestyle, surprisingly enough, which involved very little physical activity. Now, a key point here is that mendicant friaries played a significant part in the life of a medieval town and its community. Not only were their churches and precincts major landmarks, but they also fulfilled many of the roles now performed by social services, attending to the poor, sick, the homeless, and offering both physical and spiritual comfort to those in need. Human burials from the Austin Friars site have provided some intriguing glimpses into medieval life. In the cemetery, the 245 articulated skeletons, that is skeletons with all or many of the bones still in their original positions, represent both friars and lay citizens of Hull. Nearly half of the burials were of women and children, including the tiny remains of two fetuses, one which is still in the womb. Many of the skeletons of the 245 bodies discovered were still encased in oak coffins made from wood imported from the Baltic, Hull's most important trading link. And then there's a story that today's tabloids would have had a field day with. Aside of all the prayers, even song and hard manual labour, archaeologists found thin wooden rods made from hazel in some coffins, suggesting that some, if not all, of those friars who once lived at the site took part in self-flagellation ceremonies. There's more. Around 1340, analysis reveals that around 60% showed evidence of syphilis, mostly in changes to bones in the leg. Three skeletons showed more variable and more widespread lesions, including one with signs of syphilis to the skull. Carbon dating of this particular man revealed he was aged between 25 and 35 when he died, and that he was alive between 1300 and 1420. These dates prove significant because, until then, it was believed syphilis had been brought to Europe first by Christopher Columbus's crew following their return from the New World in 1493. Now, it appears that it was rife in Hull at least a century earlier. Now, before we get into the Black Death, climate change in this era has one more story to tell. The Grote Mandrenke of 1362, the great drowning of men, was the mother of all storms. An immense storm tide from the North Sea swept far inland from England and the Netherlands to Denmark and the German coast, breaking up islands, making parts of the mainland into islands, and wiping out entire towns and districts. These included Rungholt, said to have been located on the island of Strand in North Frisia, and the harbour of Dunwich. An estimated 25,000 people perished around the North Sea. This was the second St. Marcellus flood to strike. The first had been in 1219, drowning 36,000 people. Locally, the Grote Mandrenka wiped out Ravensa Odd, the port of the Dukes of Omal, that had been a serious trading rival to both Hull and Grimsby. Hugely successful, at one time it had had two members of Parliament. I digress. The point is that this was yet another example of flooding in this lowland region. Local people had to have the resilience to deal with these disruptions all the time. 
And so to section two, the Black Death. And then, out of the blue, came the Black Swan. This is a metaphor for a major event that comes as a shock, but later is rationalised as something that could have been prevented. The Black Death struck in 1349-53 to 53 and hit most of Europe. An overall mortality rate of 40-60%, to 60%, which dwarfs a comparable shock such as the 1919 influenza pandemic, which killed between 3-5% to 5% of the world's population. Strangely, the first reliable explanation of plague in Hull comes in 1472. It seems that Mayor John Whitfield was one of the victims then. Here's a map of the movement of the Black Death from its Asian routes to Europe. The plague followed the Asian Silk Roads to English ports. In autumn 1348, it struck Grimsby, then Hull, either directly from Europe or via coastal trade from southern England. Plague derives from the Greek medical term plague, meaning stroke. It's a reference to the speed with which the disease brings down its victims, and this plague was a real death blow to medieval Europe. And the plague, as it is written, gathered strength as it was transmitted from the sick to the healthy through normal intercourse, just as fire catches on to any dry or greasy object placed too close to it. And that's from Boccaccio's The Decameron. The Black Death was one of three great plague pandemics between 70 and 200 million died, and all of them had different geographic origins and paths of spread. The first, the Justinian Plague of 541, started in Central Africa and spread to Egypt and the Mediterranean. The Black Death of 1347 originated in Asia and spread to the Crimea, then Europe and Russia. The third pandemic, that of 1894, originated in the Yunnan province of China and spread to Hong Kong and India, then to the rest of the world. And here's the culprit, the Yersinia pestis, which was not discovered until the 1894 pandemic in Hong Kong by a French pastorian bacteriologist, Alexandre Yersin. This brown rat flourished in Europe where there were open sewers and ample breeding grounds and food. And here's the population in England from 850 to 1600. As you can see in 850, around 2 million, peaking at 6 million in 1300, and then a collapse to 3 million in 1350. This is a dramatic collapse. Now, history's calamities are all too often blamed on the other, and for many, the Jews were responsible for the Black Death. Allegedly, they had poisoned the water from which the plague emerged. Well, they were on the track that a waterborne disease was involved, but rather wide of the mark with their blame game. As Benediktov and others confirm, Europe loses 60 to 65% of its population. In Hull, we're talking 2,000 dead and about the same fleeing the city. And when it comes to the impact of the Black Death, this book by Oxford professor James Bellich is indispensable. The World the Plague Made. It breaks new ground and it's worth a quick summary of the findings. First, with so many dead causing severe labour shortages, serfs could now demand more in wages. In fact, Belich points out that it was the trigger for crew societies, men leaving home to go where the work was. This is an interesting point for Hull because it reflects a characteristic of the fishing community from 1880 to the 1970s, when men went to sea and women stayed at home, becoming everything from mother to father Christmas. We'll pick this up in series two. Second, this became an economic golden age for survivors. Per capita, there was more cash, fixed assets, natural resources and prime locations for agriculture and industry becoming available. Luxury goods opened up. Innovation. If you had fewer people to do the work, then one consequence is the drive to innovate. We'll touch on this in Hull in a moment. The point is that the Black Death wasn't unique on in innovations, but it did pressure cook them. More water power, wind power, and gunpower. 
and water-powered blast furnaces, heavily gunned galleons, all fast-tracked by plague. Specialization. Suddenly, farmers were more strategic about where best to grow their crops. And now for the big one, European expansion. Historians are not especially comfortable with exogenous events, events with an external cause dictating play. The Black Death was a human tragedy that abruptly halved entire populations and caused untold suffering. But it also brought about a cultural and economic renewal on a scale never before witnessed. The world the plague made is a panoramic history of how the bubonic plague revolutionized labor, trade and technology and set the scene for Europe's global expansion. Setting the rise of Western Europe in global context, Belich demonstrates how the mighty empires of the Middle East and Russia also flourished after the plague, and how European expansion was deeply entangled with the Chinese and other peoples throughout the world. Why Europe? E. Pestis suggests otherwise. Belich does not consider it the killer explanation. I do not claim, he says, that plague dominated the causal jigsaw. I do suggest that it's the biggest missing piece, whose inclusion casts new light on the whole. The impact of the Black Death is measured in mortality. Let's not underestimate the value of this data. Because of it, we can start to explore trade flows and the speed of infection, which comes into its own with other pandemics later on. Hull was so badly hit that Edward III cancelled taxes. The clergy around Hull and the East Riding were badly hit. In 1349, there were 95 vicars across the East Riding. 60 died, and between 1326 and 1364, the parish church of the Holy Trinity lost seven vicars, four from 1345 to 49 alone. In 1349, Muse Abbey had an earthquake in the spring, and then the Black Death. 80% of Muse Abbey's monks, including Abbot Hugh of Leven, died. Ten staff and over 50 men working the land died at the same time. Trade flows had become increasingly important, but there are consequences for health and well-being. As trade flows increase and a lack of labour becomes a constraint, and in a port city like Hull, even a bottleneck, the impetus to innovate accelerates. Top right, a statue in Beverly of a labourer unloading a barge. In Hull, the first cranes are installed in 1357. This huge advance led to a divergence between Hull and the rest of the Humber River landings. Hull was now an early adopter of smart technology. Surviving workers were able to demand more for their service. The poet, John Gower, wrote that they were sluggish, they are scarce, and they are grasping. For the very little they do, they demand the highest pay. 1349 Ordinance of Labourers marked the beginning of poor law. Everyone under 60 had to work for wages set at pre-plague levels. Giving alms to able-bodied beggars became an imprisonable offence. The 1351 Statute of Labourers went further, pegging the maximum wage at 1346 levels and punishing workers for moving around the country for better conditions. As we've seen, surviving workers were able to demand more for their service. 1381 brought many of the issues of the 14th century to a head. Peasants revolt, mainly in the south, but there were uprisings in East Yorkshire as well. The revolt had various causes, the socio-economic and political tensions generated by the Black Death, the high taxes from the Hundred Years' War with France, instability within the local leadership of London, and the laws restricting wages and mobility were ineffective. Wages still rose and discontent fueled the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. And that's another story. And so, section three, care or cure. We've looked at the medieval context for Hull. We've looked at disease, and in particular, the Black Death. Now for the journey from sin to science. 
After the outbreak of the Black Death, doctors and scientists immediately tried to fit the disease into their existing understanding of medicine. First up, astrology. The air of the earth, they said, was overheated and corrupted by a 1345 conjunction of the planets Mars, Saturn and Jupiter, all of which were considered hot, and the zodiac sign of Aquarius, a wet sign. This unnaturally hot and moist air blew across Asia towards Europe, causing plague wherever it passed. When medieval doctors referred to a pestilence, they often did not mean the disease itself, but the poisoned air that engendered the disease in human bodies. We also have this, the Wound Man, a surgical diagram which first appeared in 14th century European medical manuscripts. The illustration was annotated to guide the reader through various injuries and diseases whose related cures could be found on the text's nearby pages. The image first appeared in a printed book in 1491 when it was included in a Venetian text likely to be Europe's first printed medical miscellany. It's interesting that the wound man is manifestly still alive, despite being hit by the proverbial kitchen sink of weaponry. This highlights the optimism of a profession that is starting to see solutions to injuries. As we shall see, it will take even more observation of living conditions to extend the solutions to the living environment. The wound man on the right is more prescriptive. Again, we're asking questions about the framework in which the health of Hull is considered as we progress through the timeline. This chart shows only about 10% of medieval hospitals cared for the sick in the way that modern hospitals actually do. They were only called hospitals because they provided hospitality, i.e. a place to rest and recuperate. Most hospitals were actually almshouses for the elderly and infirm, which provided basic nursing but no medical treatment. Other hospitals were situated on important pilgrimage routes and were set up as hostels for pilgrims. Before the Reformation, Hull had many maisons dieu, large and small. Here are just some of them. Ravenser and Selby's Hospital housed 12 poor men on the north side of Holy Trinity. Bedford's Hospital, Greg's Hospital, the Aldwick Hospital on Lowgate... Adriansen's Hospital, which was probably founded by a Scandinavian or German, and then Ripplingham's Hospital, and there were others in Whitefrigate, on Scale Lane and Chapel Lane. So provision did exist, and many of them for the poor. As we consider the emphasis on care and cure, developments in the Muslim world at this time offer an interesting contrast. Medical care by physicians or doctors seems to have been rare in medieval hospitals, not so in the Bimaristan, a Persian word meaning hospital in the historic Islamic world, Bimar meaning sick person, stan meaning place. In the 1100s, Baghdad alone had 60 Bimaristans. They served all people, regardless of race, religion, class or gender, with separate wards for different illnesses. Mental illness, contagious diseases, non-contagious diseases, surgery and eye diseases, something unheard of in Europe at this time. Each Bimaristan contained a kitchen, pharmacy, library, mosque and occasionally a chapel for Christian patients. Musicians were often employed to comfort and cheer patients up. They also served as medical schools to train students. Hull had a number of monasteries within the walls, Augustinians, Whitefriars, Greyfriars, Blackfriars, Dominicans and Carthusians. In 1350, William de la Pole founded a hospital in Hull, later to be called the Charterhouse, and shortly before he died in 1366, he obtained the king's permission to found a religious house. This was eventually established by his son Michael. The whole charter house was the site of a Carthusian monastery and almshouse named Maison Dieu. It was primarily a hospital 
and was spared during Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. It underwent rebuilding in 1645 and 1780 and is a veritable architectural oasis to this day. Aside of the plague, how was the profession of medical practice evolving? Well, doctors, physicians were more hated than fated, and these were often considered as quacks. Chaucer's physician from the Canterbury Tales sums things up. With us there was a doctor of physic, he says. In all this world was none like him to pick for talk of medicine and surgery. For he was grounded in astronomy. He often kept a patient from the pole by horoscopes and magic natural. Well could he tell the fortune ascendant within the houses for his sick patient. He knew the cause of every malady, were it of hot or cold, of moist or dry, and where engendered and of what humour, he was a very good practitioner. And he goes on to introduce the second healthcare expert of the day, ready he was with his apothecaries to send him drugs and all electuaries, medicines mixed with sweets, by mutual aid much gold they'd always won. And therein lies the tale. The quack was, initially at least, a man of the people. In Hull, in 1599, there was a doctor, Citois. He could hardly speak English, but in spite of this mishap, he soon made progress. At the same time, there was a Jewish rabbi called David de Pommy, who made it his business to compete. Each would call the other a quack. And by the way, the term quack originates from quacksalva or quacksalva, a Dutch word for a seller of nostrums, medical cures of dubious and secretive origins, another lowlander link perhaps. And then the apothecaries, primary healthcare in its earliest form. We'll explore this profession in more detail in the next webinar. One last image for me to leave you with. For many of us, this plague doctor with the beak is a symbol of the Black Death and plague. In fact, this garb doesn't really come together until much later. The example is from 1616 to 1721. Nonetheless, elements do emerge earlier. As a composite, and along with the humours and the wound man, it sums up where we've arrived in health by 1485 the close of this session. The hat, this means the doctor and personifies an increasing status. The beak, filled with aromatic herbs to filter and purify the air breathed, according to the miasmic humorial doctrine, the plague was due to bad air, malaria. The cloak and the full covering of the body, a recognition that disease can spread. The cane, this is an early recognition of social distancing and along with gloves, a sense of handling disease with care. The notebook, medical practitioners are starting to take notes, make observations and starting to join the dots. Remember what we said about causation. And the parallel with our own time, we've lived through COVID lockdowns and a behaviour change on PPE. I remember being in Japan years ago and seeing people wearing masks on the underground. It, it seemed strange. This is no longer strange. People are wearing masks when they have a cold, out of politeness. In the time of plagues and Comedia dell'arte, the mask had many roles to play. Time to close. Let's highlight the historical context that we've covered and then our progress on health. First, the birth certificate. Edward I grants Kingston upon Hull a charter in 1299 and our story is up and running. Second, an illustration of a risky topography comes with the floods and famine of the early 1300s. Third, we see the emergence of the grid of streets within fine brick-built walls. Seven hospitals within the walls, no roads to speak of beyond. Four, the big hit of the Black Death and the innovation that sets Hull apart around the Humber. Remember those cranes. And then on the 22nd of August 1485, Richard III falls at the Battle of Bosworth Field and Henry VII takes us into the Tudor period. In the next webinar, Hull will see quite a bit of the Tudors. Now to cause, care and cure. Overall, we've been asking about the nature of disease, the care and the cures. 
We note the persistence of Hippocrates' four humours, then, second, the emergence of Maison Dieu, places where the old and the infirm could be cared for. And three, we see the division of labour within the practitioners, specifically the physician and surgeon, and then the apothecaries. Watch these guys carefully as they take over what would now be called primary health care. And then four, the quacks. They'll be with us for a while longer. Enough said. You have been listening to Rob Bell and a History of Health in Hull. Do please visit the Rob J. Bell webinar site, and I'd appreciate it if you could subscribe and like. Thanks for listening.